So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to talk about Stallnecker's notion of diagonalization. This is probably the most complicated part of the video, so it's going to require some reasonably extensive board work in a moment. But before we get to the board, it's going to be helpful to do a few things. It's firstly going to be helpful to get a sense of why diagonalization is important for Stallnecker, because that will sort of guide us to where we want to go, to get a sense of what work is it supposed to be doing in the first place. Once we've done that, there are going to be two observations that are going to be important for how we start drawing these graphs that Stonecker has in the paper, or these grids that he has in the paper. The reason why diagonalization is important is because of this principle of uniformity that we mentioned at the end of our original exposition of Stonecker's theory. So remember what uniformity said. It said that you should only assert things using sentences that express the same proposition in every world in the context set. Put differently, you should, ex you should only assert things using sentences where everybody makes the same presuppositions about what the sentence says. We know exactly, or we presuppose, a particular proposition to be the proposition, the proposition the sentence expresses. The reason why Stalnaker needs this notion of diagonalization, or why he wants this notion of diagonalization, is because there are various reasons to think that that principle is overly strong, or at least to think that sometimes it's going to break down, and when it does break down, we need an account of what happens. So in particular, there are going to be cases where uniformity is violated, where you say some sentence in a sort of assertive way, even though that sentence could mean different things from the purpose from the perspective of your audience. And there are going to be some situations like that where actually it seems like there's a perfectly good way to update on what the speaker says. And the role of di the diagonal is going to be to say what is it that it gets communicated in certain situations like those. So some of the situations where that happens, where you have a sentence that expresses various different propositions and yet something, some sort of communicate effect seems to happen, Situ there are a couple of different kinds of situations like that that Stalnaker has in mind. Some of them are more theoretical, so these cases at the very end of the paper where he talks about necessary propositions that seem informative. That's sort of a theory-driven case, so based on our theory of propositions, we're forced to say certain propositions are necessarily true or false, and Stalnaker wants to try and explain what's, you know, how we can actually say those things, because sometimes it does seem like we say those things and communicate something informative. We won't focus on those cases, we're going to focus on just very different, simple cases that are not driven by theory at all, but are just sort of driven by intuitions about cases. So for example, suppose that I'm talking to you, but I don't know who you are. Maybe there's a few different people that you could be. Um, and maybe I say some sentence like, you are tall. Now in this, in this setting, given my beliefs. Now maybe you know who you are, but I don't know who you are. It is not going to be common ground who you are. There are going to be various different people who, given everything we're presupposing, you could be. But we talked about things like you and I in previous lectures. We said that those expressions are context sensitive, so what they stand for depends on what context we're in. So in this kind of particular context, you is just going to stand for you, whoever you are. But of course, I don't know who you are. So what this means is I, in this situation, actually don't know exactly what is picked out by the word you, because I know it, what, whoever it picks out is the person I'm talking to, but I don't know who that person is. So I don't know exactly what the word you picks out. So this is a, is a case where the sentence, you are tall, as said by me, seems to violate the principle of uniformity. So maybe I think you could be Alice in worlds where you're Alice, or where in worlds where Alice is one of the people in the conversation. The sentence, you are tall, picks out the proposition, Alice is tall. But maybe you could also be Billy in the worlds compatible with our presuppositions where I'm talking to Billy. The sentence, you are tall, picks out the proposition, Billy is tall. So that's why uniformity is, va is violated, because the same sentence, given the fact that I'm ignorant about who you are, will pick out different propositions depending on who I'm in fact talking to, and I don't know that fact. Nonetheless, 
when I say you are tall, even in a situation like that, if I even if I don't know exactly who you are, it does seem like I've per communicated something perfectly sensible. And in particular, it doesn't seem like I've done anything really wrong by saying that, by saying you're tall in such a situation, even if I don't know exactly who you are. So we need some sort of story about what's going on in a situation like that. When I say a sentence, even if I don't know what, what proposition it expresses, sometimes I'm able to communicate something genuine, and we need to say, well, what is it that gets communicated? So I've given a particular example where it's the person speaking who doesn't know what proposition the sentence expresses. But you could easily imagine cases where the ignorance lies with the audience rather than the speaker. So I'm at, you can try to construct for yourself some case where the speaker perfectly well knows what proposition a sentence is expressing, but they also know that the audience won't perfectly know what proposition that is. So see if you can think of a case like that. And in fact, you know, I focus on an example using the word you, that should give you some sort of clue to how we can construct a situation where the ignorance lies with the audience rather than the speaker. So that is what diagonalization is supposed to do. It's supposed to help us with cases like those where it looks like there's some genuine communication going on, even when there's ignorance about what proposition is expressed by a particular sentence. To start getting a grip on what might be going on in cases like that, we need to think a bit more about how context sensitivity works and how it relates to the notion of a world, of a possible world. Because once we start thinking about it, we can see that when we start thinking about what sentences mean and propositions and all those kinds of things, that there are actually two important roles that possible worlds play. So we already have this idea that sentences express propositions. We're working with the view that propositions are just sets of possible worlds. So one thing that the actual world that we're in is going to do is it's going to settle whether a proposition is true or not. So remember that was one of the very first things we said about possible worlds is they settle for every proposition whether it's true or not. So that's one important role that possible worlds play when it comes to thinking about whether sentences are true and whether the propositions they express are true or not. One role for a possible world is just to tell you whether the proposition expressed by a sentence is true or not. But they also have a second role. Because remember, we said that certain sentences are context sensitive. What that means is the context in which they're uttered determines exactly what proposition those sentences express. So for instance, the fact that, you know, in the context of utterance right now, I'm the one speaking, that's what determines that when I say I'm tired, I express the proposition David Boylan is tired. We've thought about context of utterance as like particular situations with a particular audience and people involved. Put it differently, we're, the way we thought about context so far is you can think of them as like parts of worlds, certain bits of a possible world. And what this means is you can sort of zoom out and you can think that, well, if a context is sort of a part of a world, one of the things that you're going to settle is, so if you found out what possible world you're in, that would also in particular settle, well, what context am I in right now? Because remember, worlds settle all the facts. So if you find out what world you're in, that's also going to settle what context you're in. So that actually may help, makes a sort of helpful simplification, because if we know if the world actually ultimately determines the context, then instead of context, we can just think of the world as, we can sort of, by extension, think of the world as also representing the context in certain situations. And once we've done that, we can see that, well, if contexts represent, or if contexts determine the proposition, that gets expressed by a sentence, and if a possible world determines what context you're in, then in a way, in addition to determining whether a proposition is true, a world is also going to determine what proposition is expressed by a sentence. So for instance, if I say the sentence, I'm tired, and we discover that we're in a particular world, well, because the world settle all the facts, that's in particular going to settle what context we're in, and since the context settles what that sentence says is said by me, the world is in turn going to determine what proposition gets expressed by a sentence. So this is the second role we can think of worlds as playing. So in addition to settling whether propositions are true or not, because they settle what context you're in, a world is also going to settle what propositions sentences express. So once you've isolated these two things, you've pulled apart the role the, the world of the role for evaluating, and the world for the role is sort of fixing the meaning, 
you can see that when we have a particular sentence, and if you and I are having a dispute about whether that sentence is true, there is theoretically at least two things we could be disagreeing over. It could be that we are to in total agreement about what proposition expresses, and because we just have different views on what world we're in, we have different views about whether the proposition is true or not. So if we both know that when I say it's raining, I mean it's raining around here, but we have different views about the weather, that's one way to disagree about whether that sentence is true or not. However, because in certain cases, what proposition a sentence expresses depends on the world in which it is said, there's another way for us to disagree about whether a sentence is true. And it might just be because we disagree over what proposition it expresses. So for instance, suppose that we have different views about what time it is right now. Maybe I think it's four o'clock and you think it's five o'clock. We might have a disagreement over say, like whether the sentence you're supposed to be at the dentist right now um, is true. So even imagine we are totally agree about when the appointment takes place. Suppose we both agree that it's at 4 p.m. If we have a disagreement about what time it is, we're gonna disagree about whether that sentence is true because we're gonna think it means different things. So if you're the person who thinks it's now four o'clock, you're gonna think that sentence says, you're supposed to be at the dentist at 4 p.m. If I'm the person who thinks it's five o'clock, I think the sentence says, you're supposed to be at the dentist at 5 p.m. Given that we both agree you're supposed to be at the dentist at four, we're going to disagree about whether that sentence is true because we have differing views about those two propositions. So what Stoniker is going to do is he's gonna use these two ideas. So we, our first idea was the contrast between the role a world plays in making the proposition expressed by a sentence true versus determining what proposition is expressed by a sentence in the first place. That idea, plus the different ways of agreeing or disagreeing about whether a sentence is true or not, these are gonna be the things we use to define this notion of the diagonal proposition. And as I said, Stoniker's view is basically gonna be that this thing we're gonna define, the diagonal proposition, this is what we express in cases where uniformity is violated. So we're gonna introduce the idea of the diagonal proposition by working with this example that Stolniker gives in the paper. So he has this an example in the paper which illustrates these two different kinds of disagreement. Disagreement over the proposition versus disagreement over what proposition is expressed happening all at once. So let's remind ourselves of how that went. What we're imagining is I am speaking to this person O'Leary and there's this other person, Daniels, who's, who is nearby. And I say to O'Leary, you are a fool. Now, as a matter of fact, I'm talking to O'Leary, and we'll also suppose as a matter of fact that I'm correct, that O'Leary is indeed a fool. But O'Leary and Daniels have two different views of what's just happened. O'Leary knows that I'm talking to him, so we both agree that when I said, you are a fool, I express the proposition, O'Leary is a fool but we have different opinions about whether O'Leary actually is a fool or not. As we say, as we saw, I correctly think he is, but let's say, well, O'Leary, because he is a fool, doesn't think that he is a fool. So we have a disagreement. We agree over what proposition is expressed. We just disagree over whether that proposition is true or not. So we'll also imagine though that Daniels is standing nearby and he mistakenly thinks that I'm talking to him. So I'm actually not, I'm talking to O'Leary, but he thinks I'm talking to him. Now, if he thinks I'm talking to him, Another way to put that is he has a different view, a mistaken view, about what the sentence, you are a fool, means, as said by me. He thinks it means the proposition that Daniels is a fool. And we'll imagine that we both agree that that's not true. I don't think he's a fool, and Daniels doesn't think that Daniels is a fool either. It'll be helpful as well to see, well, what does O'Leary think? We'll also say that O'Leary mistakenly thinks that Daniels is a fool. So. Daniels and I have this second kind of disagreement. Maybe we agree on all the facts about who is a fool in this situation or not, but we disagree about what the sentence you are a fool expresses. I think it says that O'Leary is a fool correctly. Daniels incorrectly thinks I'm talking to him and inc so incorrectly thinks I'm saying, asserting the proposition, Daniels is a fool. So that's our situation. So it's gonna be helpful to, to draw up that information in the side. So. The actual world is the one that I think we're in. And what happens is I'm talking to O'Leary, 
O'Leary is a fool, and Daniels isn't. That's the world that we are in, which is the same as the world that I think we're in, because I'm correct in this situation. Now, for simplicity, we can just imagine that there, there are actually going to be a lot of other worlds, but we're going to just assume that there are just two other worlds for the moment. And the two other worlds are going to correspond to the different views of O'Leary and Daniel's half of what's going on. So let's start with O'Leary's world. I'll call it W.O. So we know that we can remember this is the world according to O'Leary. So we said that O'Leary was correct about who's being addressed. He knows that I'm talking to him. Um, but he is the fault. He has the wrong view about foolishness. He incorrectly thinks that he is no fool. So he thinks O'Leary is not a fool. And he incorrectly thinks that Daniels is a fool. Daniels is a fool. So this is the world according to O'Leary. It's not the actual world, because all of these things are in fact false, but that's how things seem to him. And the last one we're going to play with is the world according to Daniels, who's doing a bit better. So we saw that Daniels is mistaken about who's being addressed, so he thinks I'm talking to Daniels. But he has the correct view of who is, who is a fool or not, so he correctly thinks O'Leary is a fool, and he correctly thinks Daniels is not a fool. Okay, so that's just a summary of our situation. We have these three worlds, the actual world, I'll write this as W at sometimes for actual world. We have WO, that's the world as O'Leary sees it, and we have WD, that's the world as Daniels sees it. So we know that we're thinking about propositions as sets of possible worlds. So one way to sort of, we saw the one way of sort of drawing what's going on with, with pictures of sets, but there's also another way that we can visualize what's going on. Because we can sort of start drawing in a grid. We can imagine that we had all the worlds lined up. Um, so in this case, because we simplified, that means we just have to line up three. So let's put WA. W, WO and WD. And we know that every proposition gives you an answer to whether the proposition is true or false at that world. So let's take the proposition that I actually express. So when I said you are a fool, because in fact I was talking to O'Leary, I expressed the proposition that O'Leary is a fool. And we can now see, well, what truth value does that proposition have in these different worlds? So we know in the actual world it's true, because O'Leary is a fool. We know in the world according to O'Leary it's false, because O'Leary falsely believes he's not a fool. And we know that it's true in the world according to Daniels, because Daniels is only mistaken about who I'm talking about. He's correct in all the facts about who is a fool or not. So what we've done is we've listed all the worlds, and we can give a list of the truth values the proposition has in these worlds. So before we represented worlds as sets of worlds where the proposition is true, but a different way of picking out a proposition would be to just sort of line up the worlds and give an answer as to whether the proposition is supposed to be true or not in those worlds. Because so for instance, if we were given this information, we could determine the proposition thought as, thought as a set of possible worlds, because we can say, oh, well, it would just be this set of these two. Or likewise, if we were just given a set of worlds where the proposition is true, we can write this row as well, because, we, well, if we know the proposition, if we know the set of worlds of the proposition is true or not, well, then that also tells us where, is it, where it's false. So we can, again, write down this row. So listing the truth values a proposition has at every, at every possible world is just another way of writing the same information as we had before, i.e. just writing down the set of worlds where it's true. So what that means is that this grid, this row, this is another way of writing down a proposition. Now obviously this is a very simplified situation because we're imagining there are only three worlds, 
but this is one of the possible propositions, given these three worlds, that there could be. And moreover, we know what proposition that is in this situation. It's the proposition that my utterance expresses in the actual world. But once we've started thinking about what proposition my utterance expresses in the actual world, we can also start thinking about, well, what about the propositions that O'Leary and Daniels think I'm talking about? What do those look like? So we can now add other rows corresponding to the propositions that they think I'm asserting. So let's start with the O'Leary world. Now remember, O'Leary actually agrees he's right about who's being talked to. He knows that I'm telling him he's a fool. So actually the proposition that I'm asserting in the world according to O'Leary is exactly the same as the proposition I'm expressing in the actual world. So it's the proposition that O'Leary is a fool. That's true in the actual world. It's false in the world according to O'Leary. And it's true in the world according to Daniels. So what's happening now is that each of these rows is corresponding to the proposition that my sentence is expressing in that world. These two rows are the same. What that indicates is that my sentence expresses the same thing in both of these worlds. That's why it's the same row, because these worlds agree on what I'm expressing. Let's finally add the Daniels world. Because here we saw that Daniels agrees with us about the facts, but he disagrees with us about what we're saying. He thinks I'm expressing the proposition that Daniels is a fool. So what's the proposition that Daniels is a fool? Well, we can write it down by just writing down the truth value that proposition has in every world. So start with the actual world. Is the proposition that Daniels is a fool true there? No, it's not. What about the world according to O'Leary? If O'Leary were right, would Daniels be a fool? And the answer is yes. So the proposition is true. And what about the world according to, to Daniels? Well, we said that Daniels knows what the world is like relative to what's the fools that are in it. He knows that he's no fool, so the proposition there is false. So we're able to write down in this row the proposition that Daniels thinks I'm expressing just by writing down the truth values that proposition has in every single possible world. So let's just recap very quickly what I've done. So we started by writing a list in a row of truth values. So we, we're assuming for simplicity there are just three possible worlds. We can identify propositions just in terms of the truth values that they have in those possible worlds, because we're saying propositions are just sets of possible worlds, and that's interchangeable with just writing down the truth value a proposition has in every possible world. So each of these rows corresponds to a proposition. So after we wrote down this row, we saw that this, this proposition, the proposition that O'Leary is a fool, corresponds to what I am in fact saying in the actual world. This row is the proposition I'm expressing in this world. But once we see that, we can then see that, well, maybe we could add rows that correspond to the different propositions that I might be asserting in different worlds. So we could add a row that corresponds to the proposition that, given O'Leary's view of the situation that I'm expressing. Now we said that O'Leary knows that I'm talking to him, so he agrees on what proposition I'm saying. He, he also thinks that I'm saying the proposition that O'Leary is a fool. And that's why these rows are the same, because it's the same proposition that's being asserted in both worlds. However, we saw that Daniels disagrees with me. He has the wrong view about what I'm saying. He thought I said a different proposition. He thought I said the proposition that Daniels is a fool. The proposition that Daniels is a fool can be thought of as just this row. It's the proposition that's false in the actual world, true in the O'Leary world, and false in the Daniels world. That just is the proposition that Daniels is a fool. So this row corresponds to the proposition that Daniels thinks I've said. So this is a way of sort of picturing this idea we mentioned earlier of the two different roles for worlds. One role for a world is just telling you whether a proposition is true or not. And this is represented by the worlds on the horizontal. Because if I'm trying to figure out, if I'm using a world in that capacity, well then I've already figured out what proposition I'm interested in, maybe I'm interested in this one. And the role of the worlds on the horizontal is, once you've figured out what proposition you're talking about, they're there to tell you whether it's true or not. So the worlds on the horizontal 
are representing the role the world plays in determining whether the proposition is true or not. But we said there was a second role the world can play, because we said, well, context fix what proposition a sentence says, in particular sentences like, you are a fool. Worlds, in turn, determine what context you're in. So worlds will determine, if you know what world you're in, you will all also thereby know what proposition you're expressing. And that's what the, ro the worlds in the vertical are representing. So for instance, this world corresponds to the actual world, and that's why the row here is the proposition that's actually being expressed, because here the world, we're interested in the world as it actually is, the world as it actually is determines that this is the proposition that I express. The world as O'Leary thinks it is determines that I express the same proposition, but the world as Daniel sees it, the world that we would be in if Daniels were correct, tells us the sentence would express a different proposition there. It would express this, the proposition corresponding to this assignment of values, which is of course different. So now we have a picture of, that represents both of these roles. It's important to notice that these are exactly the same worlds in both cases, because the whole point is that the ver each world does both of these two things at the same time. So a world will both tell you what proposition is being expressed, and it will tell you whether that proposition is true or not. So it's precisely because it's the same worlds appearing on the vertical and the horizontal that represents the fact that each world is simultaneously doing two things. It's determining what proposition is expressed, and it's determining whether that proposition is true or not. So now we can finally start talking about the diagonal, now that we've got all this in place. And the way to start thinking about the diagonal is to notice that the cells, as you go this way diagonally, actually play a special role. Because imagine we're interested in just the question, so we know as a matter of fact I made some utterance, I said the sentence, you are a fool. And imagine we just ask the question, did I say something true by saying that sentence? Did I end up asserting a true proposition? To answer that proposition, basically we have to look at this diagonal row. Because if I want to, so our question is, did I say something true by saying that sentence? Well, we know that the different worlds are going to give different answers to that, because the different worlds say different things about what proposition I expressed. So to find the answer to that question at the actual world, we first say, well, what proposition did I express? I.e., we go down the vertical and we find the actual world. So, so we figured out what proposition I've expressed. So to answer the question then, did I say something true? The we find the answer to that question at the actual world by then finding the actual world on the horizontal. So we first found it on the vertical to figure out what proposition we're talking about. We then figure out whether that proposition is true by finding the cell corresponding to the same world on the horizontal. And then we look and we see, well, the answer is true. And now let's see what the answer to that same question is at the various different worlds. So our question was, when I said, you are a fool, did I say something true? What's the answer to that question at the world as O'Leary sees it? Well, to figure out that question, we got to first figure out what did I say? So we go down the vertical until we find the world according to O'Leary. That tells us what proposition I expressed. I expressed this proposition. And then we got to find out, well, is that proposition I expressed true at that world? Is the proposition that I expressed in the world according to O'Leary true in the world according to O'Leary? To figure that out, I go across the row until I find the cell that corresponds to the world as O'Leary sees it. So again, I go down the vertical to find the world as O'Leary sees it, and then to find the truth value, the, the answer to my question, I go across until I again find the world as O'Leary sees it. So the answer to the question, did I say something true in saying you are a fool? Again, I look at the diagonal to find the, the answer to that question. And finally, again, we can ask, in the world as Daniel sees it, what's the answer to the question, did I say something true by saying, you are a fool? As the procedure is the same, we got to first find out what proposition did I say in the first place. To do that, we go down the vertical till we find the world according to Daniels. 
Once we do that, we know, well, this row, this is the proposition that I expressed in that world. To answer our question, we got to say then, is that, is that proposition true in the world as Daniel thinks it to be? Is it true in the world we would be in if Daniels were correct? And to find that, we go across this row until we find the world as Daniel thinks it is. And as we saw, the answer there is false. So we can ask this question, did I say a true thing in asserting that sentence? And to find the answer to that at various different worlds, so we might want to know, is that true of the actual world? Is that true in the world according to O'Leary? Is that true in according to the world as Daniel sees it? The answer to that question lies in the diagonal. To find the answer to that question at a particular world, you look at the cell and the, the diagonal that corresponds to the world that you're interested in. But now notice that this thing here, this is an assignment of truth values at particular worlds. Another way of saying it, this row, the diagonal, is itself a proposition. It's a proposition that's true in the actual world, false in the world according to O'Leary, and false in the world according to Daniels. It is the proposition that I said something true by saying you were a fool. Because that proposition is true in the actual world, and it's false in the other two worlds. It's true in the actual world, because in the actual world I said the proposition O'Leary is a fool, and that's true. It's false in the world according to O'Leary, because according to O'Leary I said O'Leary is a fool, and in that world O'Leary is not a fool. And the proposition that I said something true by saying you are a fool is false in the worlds according to Daniels, because according to Daniels I said that Daniels is a fool, and that proposition is false in the world according to Daniels. So this horizontal row not only tells us the answer to a particular question, but it itself corresponds to a particular proposition. It corresponds to the proposition that my sentence expresses a true proposition. So that's how to find the diagonal in this case. What you do is you draw the rows that correspond to the different possible truth values of the proposition expressed in each of the different worlds as the different people see it, and you look at the diagonal, and the diagonal is going to give you the proposition that you said something true by using that sentence. Now the proposition that you said something true by using that sentence is a different proposition to the proposition you expressed by using that sentence. And this grid demonstrates that. Because this proposition, well it agrees. So I'd say, well is this proposition, is this one the same as this one? And the answer is no, because they differ in their truth values somewhere. In particular, this proposition, what is its truth value in the world according to Daniels? Well, it's false in the world according to Daniels. But the proposition that my sentence actually expresses in the actual world is true in the world according to Daniels. So this proposition must be different from, from the proposition that my sentence expresses in the actual world. I won't go through each of the other cases, but the same thing holds up. The proposition in this case, that my sentence expresses something true, is a different proposition from the proposition my ex sentence expresses in each of these worlds. So this proposition, which we said is, is the proposition that my utterance expresses a true proposition, this is what we're going to call the diagonal proposition. And we saw that in this case, the diagonal proposition is a different proposition from any of those asserted at any of the individual worlds. It's, worth, it's important to notice though that that is precisely because of a special feature of the situation. In particular, the diagonal is different precisely because uniformity is violated. So uniformity is violated because uniformity says you, try, you, should be you should be asserting sentences that express the same proposition in all the worlds in the context set. Here, these are the worlds in the context set. But I express different propositions in those different worlds, because each of us has a different view of what's going on in this situation. And it's precisely because I'm asserting a different proposition, that this proposition is different from this proposition. That's why the diagonal is a different proposition from any of those on the rows, i.e. it's a different proposition from 
any of the propositions that my sentence actually expresses in any of these worlds. I won't fill that out, but you'll see that if in fact we all agreed on what I was saying, if we all were correct, for instance, that I was saying O'Leary was a fool, the result of getting the diagonal proposition would be exactly the same as the proposition I would be expressing in every single possible world. That's worth actually work, sitting down yourselves and working out, and we can actually talk about it on Wednesday. But that is, as a matter of fact, true. So if, if uniformity were not being violated, the diagonal proposition would be the same proposition as, the sa as that one that I'd be expressing in every single possible world. So what that shows us is that the diagonal is only interesting, it's only a different proposition from whatever my sentence expressed, in a situation where uniformity is violated. So when uniformity fails, then the diagonal proposition, i.e. this proposition that my sentence expresses something true, that's a different proposition from whatever proposition my sentence expresses. This then points to why the diagonal is important for uniformity. The diagonal is different whenever uniformity is violated, but notice that even when uniformity is violated, so this is a picture where uniformity is violated, we still know how to find the diagonal. Even if we don't know what world we're in, we know how to find the diagonal proposition. That's something we can do no matter what world we're in. And precisely because the diagonal has that property, Stonecker says, whenever uniformity is violated, i.e. when I say a sentence where we don't know exactly what proposition it expresses, what I might instead be doing is asserting the diagonal proposition that corresponds to that sentence. So in that case, this is a special case where I'm, because we don't know what my, my sentence actually is expressing, we look for something else. We look for a proposition that we can pin down no matter what world we're in. And Stonecker's proposal is, well, since the diagonal has that property, that no matter what world we're in, we're able to figure out the diagonal proposition corresponding to my sentence. In those situations, perhaps we're uttering, we're, we, we mean to be asserting the diagonal proposition. 